Okay, so hi. So my presentation is Save for the Region, the case in the case of Williamstown Gospels relocation to Durham. Although I should say and Newcastle as well. I just thought it'd be more poetic to make it Durham at this conference, but I'm Durham and Newcastle. Um, and you can see the Lindisfarne Gospels here in the background. Um, it's an exceptionally beautiful and significant book, which in the words of Richard Gameson, who's a fantastic scholar on this manuscript, um, it's a masterpiece of calligraphy and illumination. Containing the four Gospels, the manuscript was produced in Lindisfarne around 710, before being moved by the community along Cuthbert's body and other books and relics to Durham in 993, after the Viking raids. After the dissolution of the monasteries, the book was in the possession of Sir Robert Cotton and later become part of the British Museum before being transferred to the British Library as creation in 1973 in London, where it currently remains on display. And my paper today is sort of looking at this campaign that's been going on since the kind of late 90s, uh, which advocates for the book to be moved where it's produced, i.e. in the North East, or at least where it stayed in the North East. And it's been taking place ever since the Northumbrian Association set up the campaign in 1998 and has garnered a lot of support from MPs and the public. And just to kind of give a sense of how strong this debate is, um, this is a quote from Fraser Kemp, who was former MP for Houghton and Washington. And he stated back in 2000 that the Lindisfarne Gospels are more important to this area than the Elgin marbles are to the average Greek. I think that might be a bit of an exaggeration. I don't think you can compare the two to that kind of brevity, but nonetheless, it kind of shows how fervent this debate is and how strongly people feel for and against uh, the relocation of the manuscript. And you can sort of see a very beautiful carpet page on the side here. Now, before looking at the case of Lindisfarne Gospels, I quickly want to turn to another manuscript um, called the St Cuthbert Gospel, and there is method in my madness, I promise. Um, the St Cuthbert Gospel, which you can see here on the right, um, is also a manuscript produced in the North East. Um, it was produced in Weirmouth Jarrow in the 8th century, and it's the earliest intact European book. Uh, it was discovered in St. Cuthbert's co coffin, sorry, when it was opened in Durham Cathedral in 1104. And it holds many similarities with the Lindisfarne Gospels in the sense that it, um, it was produced in the Northeast and it was associated with St. Cuthbert the Saint, obviously, who's currently in Durham Cathedral. Um, but the key difference being uh, it shares its display time equally between London at the British Library and in the North, whether that's in Newcastle or Durham. Meanwhile, with the Lindisfarne Gospels, um, they have only been displayed four times in the Northeast since 1987. Um, and it's going to be displayed for the fifth time next year um, at Newcastle's Lane Gallery. Now, to give you some context as well about the acquisition of the St. Cuthbert Gospel, um, the British Library set up a Sage for the Nation campaign around 2011 to uh, 2012, where essentially they wanted to buy the St. Cuthbert Gospel from a private owner um, and essentially save it for the nation, i.e. it would be in UK public ownership. They made a successful bid to the National Heritage Memorial Fund in March 2011, who paid for half of the 9 million estimated value. They wanted to make up the other 4.5 million pounds through a national fundraising campaign, and this was successful in March 2012, thus securing the gospel in permanent public ownership. And the reason I want to look at the acquisition of the St. Cuthbert Gospel is because it provides a really interesting framework for the debate around the Lindisfarne Gospels, because essentially the British Library proposed two sort of three key aspects to why they should acquire the Gospels. The first being heritage. Um, and for the sake of this paper, um, I'm using a sort of sociological look of um, heritage, which is defined as um, was this heritage consists of the valorization and preservation by individuals and groups of traces of the past that are thought to embody their cultural identities. Now, this is quite a broad definition, and I think we need to sort of bear in mind what we mean by cultural identity, both in a national sense and a regional one. So I've taken a quote here. This is from Dame Lynn Brindley, who was chief executive at the British Library at the time of the acquisition. And when they were successful in raising the nine million, she stated, to look at this small and intensely beautiful treasure from the Anglo-Saxon period is to see it exactly as those who created it in the seventh century would have seen it. The exquisite binding, the pages, and even the sewing and structure survive intact, offering us a direct connection with our forebears 1,300 years ago. 
Now, whether it's really scholarly to use the term Anglo-Saxon, especially for a book that was created in the seventh century, I don't want to get into too much. That's the term she uses. I do think it's quite lazy and the use of the term Anglo-Saxon is very much challenged now and rightly so. But nonetheless, that's the term she uses. So for the purposes of this essay, I will refer to it as Anglo-Saxon. Um, now, what's quite interesting here is a sort of nationalistic rhetoric going on. Uh, this idea of we have a direct connection with our forebears, which very much encourages British people to identify with the book as an art historical artifact of common identity steeped in Anglo-Saxon bookmaking. Now, what's interesting here is comparing it to a statement by uh, the very Reverend Michael Sandgrove, who was Dean of Durham at the time. And now obviously this is being shared between uh, London and North East, that was an agreement set up when it was acquired, although it is worth bearing in mind that the Friends of Durham Cathedral made an unspecified uh, donation to the uh, fundraising campaign. Might want to bear that in mind, I won't address it more, make of that what you will. But he stated, uh, for the people of Durham and North East England, this is the most treasured book. Buried with Cuthbert and retrieved from his coffin, it held a place of great honour in Durham Cathedral Priory. As part of the plan agreed between the World Heritage Site and the British Library for its display, we look forward from time to time welcoming this precious book back to the Peninsula where Cuthbert's remains are honoured. I am sure Cuthbert shares our delight. Now, what's clear here compared to the statement by Brindley is this emphasis change. Obviously, the first one being it's a very much is a regional emphasis and how much is it, it's important to the North East. But also, rather than focusing on historical identity, i.e. Anglo-Saxon, as Brindley puts it, identity, it's very much shifted to the spiritual, and particularly in regard to its proximity to St Cuthbert's Shrine when it's exhibited, say, at Pat's Green Library, which it was back in 2013, and ever since it's been kind of going on. Um, so essentially, it's essentially more than just a historical artefact for Sagrobe and for the community of the North East. It's a spiritual symbol which, by previously being contacted with St Cuthbert, in a way is a kind of relic. So heritage is the sort of first point I wanted to make. And the second point, um, and this was actually specified by the um, National Heritage Memorial Fund, um, that they had to make sure that there was enough public awareness and understanding of the gospels if they were to acquire it. Um, and this has been done in numerous ways. So in terms of access, um, the British Library fully digitized the manuscript for everyone to access at any point with all the pages. And it's on continuous expeditions, both in London, in Durham, um, there have been numerous exhibitions such as a book binding one, um, an Anglo-Saxon kingdoms one, and it's also on free display permanently at the John Ripback Treasures of the British Library Gallery. So I, the fund have said they've more or less met the access part um, of the agreement. But what I find interesting is this idea of public awareness and understanding, because it's not really specified what is meant for a manuscript to be understood. And there are numerous different ways of understanding it. So if we look at the library's website, it kind of gives this um, description of all the different techniques used for bookbinding, the inks, the parchment, the history, the language. So it could be kind of understood as an exquisite example of bookmaking. And then even more interestingly, if you go to the British Library website and look up the St. Cuthbert Gospel, you can see um, it comes under three different topics, British Library treasures, discovering sacred texts and Anglo-Saxons, i.e., a sort of international global art historical fact. So uh, the British Library treasures are things like Shakespeare's folio or old manuscripts from different authors such as Oscar Wilde, that kind of thing, and also from different countries such as East Asia and America. Um, discovering sacred texts, obviously in a religious setting and Anglo-Saxon, i.e. historical English setting. So those are kind of three main points I wanted to make, heritage, access and awareness. And now, apply them to the Lindisfarne Gospels and the campaign. Oh, there we go. Um, so this is a lovely picture of Lindisfarne. Um, well, I kind of give another brief overview of the manuscript. So the Lindisfarne Gospels were produced in the Northeast in Lindisfarne. It was moved uh, with St. Catherine Coffin to Chesley Street around 883 after the Viking raid before moving again to Durham in 993. And between 1104 and 1107, the chronicler Simone of Durham uh, associated the manuscript with Cuthbert, writing that Edfrith, Bishop of the Venerable Memory, wrote this book in honour of St. Cuthbert. So it's worth bearing in mind that the book wasn't actually associated with Cuthbert until around three centuries or four centuries after it was written. 
So the preceding chapters of the book's movements came blurry, but as we know, it was displaced, um, ended up in London and then the British Library. Now, in terms of its heritage, uh, Richard Gameson writes a big book on how it's produced in the Northeast, but not only in the Northeast, but importantly for the Northeast. So he writes about an old English poem inside the manuscript, which was composed and it quotes all the holy folks or saints or an old English halgum who are on the island. Now, while this could simply refer to the saints whose relics were on Linda's farm, i.e. Aidan, Oswald and Cuthbert, Gameson points out that had the poet wanted to highlight the three local saints, he would have named them and it is peculiar that he would have styled them as who are on the island. And this is also supported by the fact that the manuscript production would have probably involved a large group of scribes, as well as uh, people that could make or procure parchment, inks, pigments and other materials, i.e. the book isn't just like produced in the Northeast, it's just for the Northeast by people of the Northeast in Linda's farm. Looking as well to the spiritual and political background of Linda's farm at the time, Gameson posits a strong idea as to why this book was produced in the first place. So up until 664, Linda's farm was enjoying spiritual and political prosperity as it represented the cell of Iona, a monastic community, and it received a support from the Venetian or North Northumbrian Royal House due to its proximity to the Royal Centre of Bramberg. In 664, King Oswy declared favour for the continental rather than Ionian tradition, which degraded the island's reputation and resulted in mass depopulation. In 688, however, Archbishop Theodore consecrated Edbert, who was a member of the community, as Bishop of Lindisfarne. Uh, and he refurbished the church's uh, authorised translation of Cantor's body. Um, and at the same time, the new king of Northumbria, Alfred, leaned in favour of the Ionian tradition again and re-established political ties with the island i.e. Linda's farm was sort of at a high point of spiritual and political prosperity. It fell and then it was sort of reinvigorated again. And Gainton argues that this book was created at, with the backdrop of these challenges. He writes, like the promotion of St. Cuthbert and his cult in parallel to it, the Linda's farm gospels defined and celebrated the spiritual identity of a reinvigorated community and revalidated its citizens before God as well as man. So unlike the St. Cuthbert Gospel, not only is it necessarily associated with St. Cuthbert, but it's a book that is produced not only in the Northeast, but for the Northeast, and for a new spiritual identity specifically rooted in the Lindstar community. Now, this idea of heritage has changed quite a bit in modern day. Um, so there's much less of a focus on sort of the historical aspect as Gameson outlines or the scholarly aspect anyway. It's much more to do with its proximity to say Cuthbert. Um, I.e. it relies on this spiritual identity that was established over a millennium ago. And if we look at, um, this is from the 2014 exhibition at Palace Green Library. This is a few quotes from some of the visitors from the Northeast who went to see the book. Um, and this is in David Stankless review. They stated, would love to see the Gospels where they belong, back home in Durham, and my personal favourite, St Cuthbert said so. So, obviously there's this idea of the, uh, the manuscript coming back, and particularly the last quote, this idea to uh, its proximity to St Cuthbert. Its religious significance to the Northeast is indeed one of the main arguments put forward by the campaign, and this acknowledged in 1998 by former Lord Bishop of Durham, Michael Turnbull, when he says that part of the gospel significance is its association with the monastery and the remains of Cuthbert. Now I stated Cuthbert never really said so, um, but nonetheless, I think Turnbull is right to emphasize his association with the same, since the gospels, um, as well as other books such as in Cuthbert gospel, are part of the distinctly Northeast religious heritage that stems from the medieval period. And here is a lovely, uh, photo of Turnbull himself back in the 90s um, and this is a quote from a parliamentary debate I don't know if you can fully see it because it might be slightly hidden but um, it's a debate on the Lindisfarne Gospels and he stated that the Lindisfarne Gospels is part of the history of the area which defines the northeast as a center of religion culture and artistic activity particularly in the 7th to 10th centuries the interweaving of faith scholarship skills and creativity are still the foundations of much of the identity of the northeast the presence of the Nisvan Gospels would fit perfectly into this setting and enhance the sense of local cultural pride, which has sustained the character of the region over many centuries and through much change of fortune. Just take a... um, so that's kind of the big arguments put forward by 
the um, campaign for heritage. Now, um, going from good cop to bad cop, this is, I can't ever pronounce his name, but his name is Lord Strabolgi, I believe. Um, and he argues, one of the main arguments before by the library is that ultimately its national heritage is kind of more important than its regional one. Um, so in the debate, he stated the book should be kept in London with other national treasures where it could be compared with other items of Anglo-Saxon art and other manuscripts in the British Library from the early Anglo-Saxon period. Again, emphasizing this idea that the book is Anglo-Saxon, it is English, it's not from the Northeast, it is a much wider um, unified identity. However, their main arguments actually rest on the second point of public awareness and understanding. So again, turning to our guy here, um, in the same debate, he argued that the gospel should be displayed where it could be seen by the maximum number of people claiming that 1 million visitors a year were expected to visit the Ripback Gallery, which had just opened at the time. They also argued there'd be free admission to the gallery before proceeding to comment on the library's availability of highly trained conservation staff who could ensure the gospel's preservation of condition. Now there was a much more recent debate which turned back to the Lindisfarne Gospels in 2013. However, there were far greater arguments made for the Northeast side. So firstly, Roberta Blackman Wood, who was Durham City MP at the time, pointed out that the 2013 exhibition took place thanks to a 2009 agreement that Durham University could adequately house the Gospels and preserve its quality and condition. Secondly, she asked why all the national museums are in London and points out the distance and costs which prevent people from the North East, in the North East sorry, to see the book. She states that I simply say that we should make sure that these cultural artifacts are accessible to people up and down the country, regardless of how much they may have in their back pocket. So essentially there are two kind of arguments taking place here, the quantity of people that can see it and the who can see it, who are these people that are looking at the book. Um, and part of this debate, and I won't get into much of it here, but is this idea of the, uh, the North-South divide, or idea of the fact of the North-South divide. Um, and indeed, Turnbull actually pointed out in 1998, um, he pointed out the commercial aspect of the Gospels move, uh, which he argued would support the fast growing tourism industry in the Northeast. And now turning again to sort of understanding and the kind of last point of my of my paper and it's understanding again how the Gospels are viewed by people. So as stated in Catholic Gospel, we've got this historical idea, a religious, a book binding idea and our historical idea. Um, and again, if we look at the Ritback Gallery where the Lindisfarne Gospels are currently being displayed, um, it's very much decontextualized. It's surrounded by items which are valued for their contribution to a wide artistic and literary history rather than simply in themselves. Um, they have Shakespeare's first folio, old Virginia Woolf manuscripts. Um, and this sort of downplays its spiritual history, um, its regional history, um, and even its national importance in the sense that it's kind of seen as an international art historical object. Meanwhile, if you compare this to the 2013 exhibition at Palace Green Library, and I think I might have a, oh no, I don't have a, that's okay. Um, yeah, if we look at the 2013 exhibition at Palace Green Library, um, the library placed the book alongside a mixture of objects associated with the Gospels. Um, they put in relics with Cuth uh, associated with Cuthbert, um, such as his pectoral cross, his portable altar, and a ring from his tomb, as well as the St. Cuthbert Gospel, actually. Um, and also items from the north, um, such as like a St uh, Staffordshire hoard, which I believe is located somewhere in the north. I can't remember exactly where now. Um, and also an edging strip and sword bosses similar to the Lindisfarne Gospels. Um, and essentially what it did is it made the Gospels the forefront of the exhibition. It wasn't simply an accessory to a wider global art historical exhibition. With this in mind, it actually seemed to increase engagement with the Gospel. Um, so Stanley, for example, reported this as being disappointed that they could only see two pages. Um, they wanted the, the library to sort of turn the pages so they could see different parts of the book. Um, they also went into schools, there were volunteers going to schools to teach them about the history of the Lindisfarne Gospels and how it relates to the Northeast community. Uh, and looking at the upcoming exhibition in 2022, uh, this is also quite a big event in the Northeast uh, with a lot of local participation. So 
The exhibition is going to entail an accompanying programme of activities for schools um, and for the Northeast community, and it's going to encourage venues across the region to host events in celebration of its return. So the placement of the Gospels in the Northeast not only allows access to the community to see a book made in and for the Northeast, but encourages us to actively engage and learn about the Gospels as a beautiful, exciting and significant book in its own right. So to conclude, I know I'm very biased, but I do think at the very least, the Linda Swan Gospels could be shared half and half between the North East and London, as with the St Cuthbert Gospel. Um, and I do think the library, the British Library, uh, downplays its regional significant support, sorry, religious significance, um, in order to sort of put forth their own agenda, i.e. to get more visitors in their venue. Um, and indeed, Stancliffe stated at the end of the review that it might help the art historical world to understand why the presence of the Lindisfarne Gospels in Durham, like the continuing presence of St Cuthbert's remains in the cathedral next door, has such a powerful hold on the hearts and minds of people in the North East. But regardless of one's viewpoint, there is very little doubt that campaigners will continue to fight for the book's relocation, especially after this upcoming exhibition, and indeed, that the debate will be influenced by the society's shifting attitudes towards the arts and heritage sector more generally. Thank you.